when a company is first starting, they often don't have the capital to access legal guidance. And so yep. you see founders making some kind of like easy mistakes that could be avoided. And so just trying to point founders to like, what are those like key things you should get right early? Make sure you get your IP correct, make sure you mm -hmm. get your funding document correct. And kind of like, who are the lawyers that you should work with on some of those big, very early make or break company decisions? The Abstract is brought to you by SpotDraft, an end-to-end -end contract lifecycle management system that helps high-performing legal teams become 10 times more efficient. If you spend hours every week drafting and reviewing contracts, worrying about being blindsided by renewals, or if you just want to streamline your contracting processes, SpotDraft is the right solution for you. From creating and managing templates and workflows, to tracking approvals, e-signing, and reporting via an AI-powered repository, SpotDraft helps you in every stage of your contracting. And because it should work where you work, it integrates with all the tools your business already uses. SpotDraft is the key that unlocks the potential of your legal team. Make your contracting easier today at SpotDraft.com. Have you considered leveraging your legal career to launch your own consultancy? What experiences can you draw on as you build your business? When is it right to turn back to an in-house role? Today, we're joined on The Abstract by Lisa Taylor Ash, the general counsel of Shape Therapeutics, which is using programmable RNA medicines to repair the genetic causes of diseases. Pretty amazing. Uh, maybe one of the coolest companies, product offerings that I've had the, the pleasure of being able to speak to a GC from. Lisa has deep experience in healthcare, biotech, and pharma, including previous stints as a lawyer at companies that were acquired by Celgene and AbbVie for $9 billion and $21 billion, respectively. So large M&A experience here, and we're going to be chatting a little bit about that today. She's also the author of EffectiveInhouse.com, one of the ways that we got put in touch. And she built a business helping startup founders navigate their early rounds of financing and growth. We're going to be talking about both of those uh, initiatives that she's worked on, businesses that she's built uh, herself throughout the course of the podcast. Lisa, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to talk about all of these topics. Lots to dig into. Absolutely. Um, well, look, based on your comp uh, your background and, and the companies that you've worked for, I, I expect you know you have you have a love of something that maybe a lot of the government or poli sci or history majors who usually get involved in law struggle with a little bit, and that's the more traditional sciences. Uh, did you know that you know back at the beginning of your career that you wanted to have a career at the intersection of of law and the sciences? I actually did. I really, I feel really fortunate that I got exposed to that as a possibility through some parents, uh, some friends of my parents, actually. And so I knew I liked science, but I knew I didn't want to be a doctor. Don't like blood. I knew I didn't want to be a bench scientist. I didn't like being in the lab, but I loved what science could do. And so in college, I studied biology and political science. I liked both. And then I had learned that there was this path where you could combine them. Um, and I, it was really in law school that I really understood the possibility of healthcare law specifically with working with biotech and pharma as an option um, and regulatory law specifically where you can work with the FDA and CMS about how do you get drugs approved and paid for. And I just thought that was a really cool way to combine things that I enjoyed. And I also had a pretty transformative experience when I was in college and I did a program in Tanzania where I got exposed to a GSK program. GSK is a big multinational pharmaceutical company and they sure. were providing free antiretroviral therapy to children who had been born with HIV. And so just mm -hmm. really, you know, very high impact saw on the ground what the possibility of science, how it could impact lives all over the world. Um, and so just really thought that this was an industry that I wanted to be involved in. That's an amazing introduction to uh, to healthcare and, and pharma. Uh, you've been lucky, you know, after sort of building an ex expertise around healthcare and, and regulatory and, and going in-house, You've been involved in a couple of pretty large acquisitions. Uh, and, and so you've gotten to see companies both, I would say, maybe like the very small seed stage and then also these large multinationals. 
uh, just to sort of set the stage for for this part of our conversation, can you talk us through the the two big transactions that you were a part of? Yeah, absolutely. So the first transaction, um, I on both sides, I was the company that was acquired, the smaller biotech company that had created um, a singular innovative product, or in the case of Juno, kind of a platform of products around CAR T cell therapy. Um, but at Pharmacyclics, we were developing a novel therapy called ibrutinib, which is for a variety of different types of cancer, of blood cancers. And we, I joined the company right as they were launching the first drug and helped really get the commercial team up and ready, get it approved and reimbursed by CMS. And then about a year in, you know, the drug and the company were doing really well and AbbVie acquired us. And that was my first experience as, a, as an acquisition and then the subsequent integration, which I stayed for part of. And I think my biggest takeaway from that, just as a high level for people, was that when you're the small company, sometimes it's easy to be really intimidated and think that the big company is going to know everything and tell you how you weren't doing things the right way. But really, as the small company, you know, you're the expert on your product. And the big company has a ton of resources and global reach and lots of things they can leverage. But that doesn't mean they know everything about your product and what you're really focused on as a small company. Um, And I think that lesson stayed especially true during my second acquisition, where I was at Juno Therapeutics, and we were developing very novel, um, something called CAR T cells, which were one of the very first personalized medicines. This is also for a type of blood Mm -hmm. cancer. And what Juno would do, if if you'll humor me going into the science for a little bit, because it's just so cool. Please, um, uh, I wouldn't (laughs) wouldn't know what CAR T cell therapy, is that right, uh, is off the bat. So Mm -hmm. please, yes. (laughs) Okay. So the simplest way to think about it is that when you have cancer, we all actually have cancer all the time, but normally the immune system identifies those cells that are growing abnormally and destroys them and clears them out. So you don't actually get Uh progressive cancer. But for cancer that progresses, it's blind. Your immune system becomes blind to the cancer, basically. It can't see it and destroy it. And Mm -hmm. so what we do is we take a patient's T cells at Juno. So you would actually do a blood draw get your Mm -hmm. T-cells, which are a kind of immune cell, genetically engineer them in our manufacturing facility so that they have the ability to recognize the cancer, the ability that you insert a receptor so they can see the cancer in the blood. Then you grow those cells, grow a bunch of them up, ship it back in a vial back to the patient. The patient's doctor injects the patient's own T-cells back into them, and then your Uh immune system fights the cancer directly. So really exciting project, amazing um, efficacy, and that it could really help people who are otherwise going to die from their cancer, um, sometimes cure them. And so obviously very important to be careful about our language with the FDA and everything, but really Mm -hmm. tremendous uh, power of these drugs. And so, and also it was one of the very first personalized drugs. This is not just a pill that you make in a factory that goes to everyone, right? We're taking Tyler cells, genetically engineering Tyler cells and sending Tyler cells back to Tyler. So you have to make sure that you don't send Lisa's cells back to Tyler, as an example. And so it was really important from a personalized medicine standpoint, there were novel legal issues around privacy, safety, manufacturing, what kind of data you got about patients. And so when Celgene came in and acquired us, yes, they were the big company. Yes, they had a ton of oncology experience, but we really were the experts in what it meant to have one of these first personalized drug products um, and all the legal issues that came with that. So in both integrations, yes, of course, there was a lot of combination. There was a lot of following the bigger company's approach to big ticket items like SEC reporting or things like that, that they're really, they have whole teams that work on that. But when it came to the product side of things, I think it's really important when you're the um, company being acquired to be clear about your expertise, your confidence in the issues you've looked at, and make sure that you advocate for that approach during the integration and don't just kind of take whatever the acquiring party um, says is going to be the way it's done. I've got a couple more questions in integration, but but this whole idea or, or concept of personalized medicine or, or personalized drugs is fascinating. Um, mm-hmm. How long did it take to develop a therapy like that? Is this something that started, you know, in the in the nineties and and is sort of just yeah. coming to fruition today? Right? Like, how long did that take? Yeah. Um, and and also how common? I mean, it, we'll we'll talk a little bit about what Shape is doing also later mm-hmm. on, perhaps, but how many companies are there out there or how many different types of therapies are there for different types of cancer today? Like, is this something that is, is common or is this still a very sort of novel treatment that's targeted only towards very specific conditions? Yeah, it's still 
pretty new. Um, so mm-hmm. maybe to answer, CAR T cell therapy was first um, kind of thought of, people had always known that your immune system could fight and detect cancer. And so it was kind of always since the 70s and 80s, how do we figure out, how do we train your immune system to do this? Um, but there was early work at the National Institute of Health, at Memorial Sloan Kettering, at big research mm-hmm. facilities showing that this was possible. I'm probably going to get my dates wrong, but, you know, in the 90s, early okay. 2000s. We won't hold you to it. <laughs> yeah. No one fact checked me. But, 20, you know, years and years and years of ideas. And then there was a yeah. lot of um, development at these big academic medical centers for a long time, really iterating on the process, figuring out what could work. And then it really combined, um, we got the tools that we needed to be able to do this. So maybe in theory, you would thought, oh, wouldn't it be great if we could engineer our immune system to recognize cancer? But until we fully sequenced the human genome, developed a lot of editing tools that we now use for routine genetic editing, you couldn't actually make it happen. So it was really the confluence of the ideas and then the tools to be able to do the actual physical genetic edit um, that enabled these therapies to come forward. And right now, CAR T cell, there are a few companies that do it in blood cancer, and there are a whole wave of additional companies that are trying to do it in what we call solid tumor. So if you think about like lung cancer or kidney cancer, any kind of cancer that's not like a leukemia or a lymphoma, lots and lots of companies are trying to figure out how to get it to work um, for those more, if you think about a tumor, you know, it's a big con- like mm-hmm. compilation of cells. So it's harder for your immune system to get in there and recognize it and fight all of those in a solid tumor setting. Again, I'm brushing through a whole bunch of really complicated science. Um, yeah. but it's really exciting. And I think the future of this field is going to be um, really, really exciting. Um, hopefully we'll be able to cure all the cancers. That would oh. be incredible. Um, yeah. Especially given, you know, the the percentage of people today that, that end up getting cancer at some point in their lifetime. I I read a book a couple of years ago on sort of the history of cancer and cancer research. And, and I was shocked mm-hmm. by, and, and of course, that, you know, dovetails or, or aligns with longer life expectancy, right? Yeah, but of um, course. Yep. I, I, my, my biggest takeaway was, I, you know, I or at least someone very close to me is very, very likely to get cancer in my mm-hmm. lifetime, right? Um, yeah, just just given the sort of statistics, I think it was like, you know, uh, a third of American men and a quarter of American women or, or something to that effect. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe it's higher. Um, so yeah. fascinating work that, that the businesses that you've worked for are, are doing. And no wonder that the transactions are, are sort of so large. Um, yeah. I, I'm, I'm really interested to hear about your experience because you, you were a leader on the integration, uh, I think in, in both cases, in both the Celgene mm-hmm. and the, the Abvi acquisitions. Uh, any lessons that you learned that others who are about to engage in, uh, in some sort of M&A transaction might be able to learn from? I think one of the things that I've learned from going through both transactions is that legal issues we're lawyers, we think that legal issues should drive everything, but legal issues very rarely actually impact deal dynamics unless it impacts value. And so I think during a deal, being really clear with your business partners about risks that you see that impact value or risks that you see that can impact the synergy that's expected from the M&A is really the way to be effective in communicating with your business partners. If you say like, oh, there's an IP risk, you know, that's not necessarily, even though from a legal standpoint, you're like, oh my goodness, this IP risk is very real and we should be really worried about it. The deal team is really focusing on those business drivers. What are sales going to look like? How does this integrate with our overall product strategy? Um, And so I think just educating around how those risks could impact future integration or valuation is the way to like really have a seat at the table. Um, And then an the after the acquisition integration, I think what we talked about before is just if you are, and I can only speak to being a small company in the in the transaction, being the acquired party, like sure. just don't, just because you're not the bigger company doesn't mean that you don't know what you're doing. So just making sure that you're educating, advocating, explaining. Um, and in some cases, you know, it ended up like our policies ended up controlling the day, even though the bigger company had more policies, mm-hmm. had more detailed policies. Like if we had more specific things for our target, for the patients and the doctors that were going to be using our product, then in some instances, our policies ended up still staying in effect because they were more nuanced and more tailored to the specific issue. Why uh, why after sort of both of those 
integration processes were, were complete, did you decide that you wanted to go back and, and try something different? In other words, instead of staying yeah. at the big company and, and being there for a long time, maybe having great RSU packages and, uh, yeah. and <laughs> uh, stipends and such, um, why, why yeah. did you decide you wanted to sort of like get back into the, into the fold and, and go and work for smaller companies again? I think it was twofold. One is that I love the cutting edge science. And I, I don't want to say that Big Pharma doesn't do the cutting edge science because they do. They have great R&D teams. But the the purpose of the bigger companies really is on later stage assets, commercial products. And I really loved being at the forefront of what was the next big thing in science and medicine. And I think that broadly speaking, biotech tends to do that. And then from a personal career development standpoint, when you're at a small company, you get to wear so many hats. You get to focus on all the different kinds of law. You get to partner with so many functions. Um, and that's really what attracted me to in-house practice in general and is what um, keeps me motivated. I love learning new areas. Whereas I think people, and again, broad brushes, at big pharma things can be different depending on the company and the role. But I think it is more like a law firm. You might be part of like a several hundred person legal team where you have very deep issue specific knowledge privacy but you're you know you're covering 50 products but you're dealing with privacy for all 50 products whereas right. i like just personally dealing with all of the issues on one product and so i think it's just about finding the right fit for you um and i'm willing to take the risk on biotech um <laughs> big pharma is definitely more stable uh, as a result of, of those experiences, you had the opportunity a, a few years ago to launch your own consultancy advising startup founders. And, and it's a little different, I think, than maybe what other folks have done and that it, you didn't stand up your own law firm. Tell us right. about why you wanted to launch your own business first. Um, first of all, I was just super fortunate after the Juno acquisition to have some flexibility and not need to take another role immediately. So I want to uh -huh. definitely say there was luck involved in that. Um, and I, you know, I had a lot of friends that were more on the business side, on the operational side that would just ping me with a lot of these questions of like, how do I do this? Or how do I approach this? And so it kind of naturally started with friends who were at other companies just asking me questions. And I realized that you know, I had this wealth of experience of seeing development from an early stage clinical asset through a commercial launch, the regulatory mm -hmm. impact, financing, strategy. Um, and so I thought that there was kind of a niche market available, which is something we'll talk about with effective in-house as well. I kind of like seeing like, yeah. where is there a niche market that no one is quite sitting in? Um, and so I started my own consulting practice and I was very clear. I'm not providing legal advice. I did not want to, <laughs> to do that as like a law firm or a legal firm, but I said consulting advice. And I ended up working with almost 40 companies in a wide wow. range of technologies, um, medical device, cell therapy, health tech, digital tech, like very cool uses of, um, you know, how technology is meeting healthcare, how technology is meeting drug development how medical devices are evolving with better AI and monitoring. It was really fun and really cool to get to see such a wide range of technology at its earliest stage. Sometimes just an idea with a few founders um, who are working on things. And so it was really fun to iterate and help kind of point them in the right direction on some of those early issues. 40 companies, that, that's a ton. Uh, over, over what period of time? It was like 18 months. And some of those would wow. be super limited transactions, like sure. five hours meeting with the founders to just say, you know, here's a law firm you could use on this topic. Here's some advice on your pitch deck. And here are some big things to avoid early mistakes. You know, I see, I think part of the mm -hmm. other reason going back to why I did it is that when a company is first starting, they often don't have the capital to access legal guidance. And so yep. you see founders making some kind of like easy mistakes that could be avoided. And so just trying to point founders to like, what are those like key things you should get right early? Make sure you get your IP correct. Make sure you mm -hmm. get your funding document correct. And kind of like, who are the lawyers that you should work with on some of those big, very early make or break company decisions um, that I thought I had a perspective on and could share with them. Where did you find that most of your business came from? Was it coming from your own network, referrals from other GC friends? Where where, where did you find most of the business was coming from? 
mostly, so it started out on my own network and then uh -huh. um, through some of the early companies, I got connected into venture capital firms that were investing in these companies. And then those uh -huh. VCs were like, oh, can you help this other portfolio company that I just did a seed round in? So it kind of just became this whole network where it was a little bit of referral, either through the startup um, founders themselves or through the VC. And then also through my network, um, you know, one of my, we talked about small engagements. One of my biggest engagements was a former um, person on the commercial team that I'd worked with at a prior company reached out. Their company had some really exciting phase two data and they were getting ready to think about how to build out a compliance and a program for their drug to actually become commercial. And so they wanted a lot of help thinking through some of those early things on how do you design a compliance program? How do you think about regulatory issues and connecting them with the right law firms to help them do that? VC firms, that's very smart. Um, I, I mean, part of part of us talking about this, I think, is that there are a lot of folks who are maybe are out there in the market right now who might be between jobs or who are yeah. thinking about standing up a, a sort of consultancy. Um, I actually had my own privacy consultancy for a little while, and there are some practical lessons I think that you learn very quickly <laughs> in the few months of running your own business. Um, I had great yeah, clients, absolutely. but uh, you know, when are you going to invoice if it's you know net thirty or net ninety, or that means when you know cash flow yeah. looks different. <laughs> yeah. um, do you have practical advice for for others, maybe in particular folks with GC experience who might be looking at launching their own consulting businesses? Yeah, maybe just to slightly clarify the question, just because I think more people should sure. do this. You don't have to have GC experience, right? I wasn't yeah. a GC when I did this. Um, so I think it's all about, you said you did privacy related work. It's about finding what yep. is your area of expertise and what value could you bring? Um, if you are going to provide legal services, make sure you check with your state bar association to be very clear <laughs> about what you need to do there. Um, just as a very obvious, but important reminder. Um, I think... You know, the tactics on invoicing and all that, you kind of just have to figure out and work it out based on your own client. But I think the biggest point of that is you have to trust your gut a lot and like who you work with, because mm -hmm. there were definitely some early things where I was like, oh, they're not going to get funded or they're, you know, I don't like how they're approaching this. And then I think at the start, I was like, oh, well, I'm trying to build this. I should work with them anyways. And that was always the thing where like, you know, they don't end up paying you or it's right. Some sort of, you know, just trust your gut on who you work with. Um, and I think the other one is really, even if it's going to be a small engagement, think about it as a long-term relationship. So make sure you're clear about what value you're bringing, articulate what that value is, and be very clear and direct up front about what you're worth. I think I've seen other people start and kind of be like, oh, well, you know, just afraid to like ask for the hourly rate or afraid to just yeah. put it out there. And it's like, it's, I think it's all about confidence here's the value I bring, here's how much I charge, here's how I think we could start working together to build our relationship. And a longer term vision I have is X, Y, and Z, um, you know, if it works out for both of us. And I think just going in really clear and direct at the start um, solved a lot of those problems. But it's definitely a skill set. At the start, I was much sure. worse at it than I was about a year in where I was like, here's the deal. <laughs> you want to work with me, <laughs> X, Y, and Z are going to happen. At the start, it was much, uh, much more wandering, I think. Um, but I think it just works better when you're clear and transparent about what you can add and what you expect in return. Another sort of practical question there. Do you have a perspective on taking equity uh, as opposed to sort of being paid for your services, how, how you make yeah. that decision or call? Yeah. I, I yeah, think that's, that's an interesting one. I struggle with that one sometimes myself too. And, and I think a lot of people, even maybe if they don't have consultancies, maybe they have a couple of sort of advisor-like gigs where they're yeah. counseling mm -hmm. someone, they, they struggle with that as well sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. And the companies struggle with it as well. I think it's hard for companies sure. to know like which engagement warrants equity, which doesn't. Um, the way I approached it is that I almost always started out with like a cash, just hourly or like fixed engagement as you get to know people because you need to, for it to be equity, but I think both sides need to be comfortable that this is like a longer relationship. You have to act, you're taking a bet on the value of the company. Um, you have to believe in that. Um, and I think you have to, prove that you are a good fit in working with them before you like make that ask. So usually how I would start is say, you know, first when I was doing the consulting, if we're working, let's do the first three months at an hourly rate, we'll work together, we'll see how things are going. And then I'd love the opportunity to discuss um, equity in the future if it makes sense for both of us. 
So just start with cash and then but, but at the beginning, open the door to equity if it, you think it's something that you're interested in. So that's how I approached it. And I ended up maybe like a quarter or less, I ended up doing some some combination of equity or all equity and cash, um, but mostly cash because I think you're taking, especially with a very early stage companies, yeah. you're taking a big flyer <laughs> on equity <laughs> and you want to make sure you know you can still pay the bills. So I think especially if it's your right full-time business, it's not just a yeah. one thing on the side, right? Oh yeah. <laughs> if it's one thing on the side and you don't care, like shoot for the moon, go for equity. Um, if yeah. you think the relationship's there. Um, that's what I do now. I still have a few of them ongoing right now and it's all equity because it's not my mm -hmm. primary thing. That's great advice. Quick announcement before I let you get back to the episode. SpotDraft just released our annual compensation report for in-house legal professionals. If you're wondering how your compensation compares to your peers across industries, years of experience, and more, make sure to check it out. Find it at salary-report.spotdraft.com or head to the link in the description. Now, let's get back to the episode. What what led you, you know, you've built this, you built up a consulting business it was going well uh what what led you to decide that it was time to go back in house and and i also i'm also curious like mm -hmm. you know tell us a little about what shape does too here because I, I i gave a very brief summary at the intro but yeah. um as, as we've learned you understand and can explain the science a lot better than i can <laughs> yeah um so the um, founders at shape were people I had worked with previously at juno therapeutics so i knew them I had relationships with them and i thought that the science that they were working on was so cool um yeah so that's, that's the short answer is like the science was so interesting again i love being at the forefront of cutting edge technology and i thought that's what shape was trying to do um really interesting legal and regulatory issues as well which we can talk about a little bit more as i describe yes. what we do but that's the short story is just people i knew and it was really cool science and the consulting side is great because you get exposed to so many things, but you don't ultimately have control or that like direct influence over what actually happens. And I kind of missed mm -hmm. having that kind of deeper in the weeds, um, kind of product specific approach to developing something new and bringing it to patients. So that's why I did shape. All right. So I'll do my best to explain what shape yeah, does. What shape does. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're a gene therapy company. And so we'll go back to high school biology for a minute, if you'll bear with me. So Please. if you remember, there's DNA, then DNA turns into RNA, and then RNA mm -hmm. turns into proteins that fuel your body. So we try to edit RNA, that middle step. So we're not making a permanent edit to DNA or your genome, mm -hmm. which is what like companies that use CRISPR, if you've heard about that at all, CRISPR yeah. edits your DNA. It's a permanent change to like the core, software of your body is how we think about it. RNA is more of like a transient protein. RNA is what was based on the COVID vaccine, if you recall, where they would just deliver RNA into your body. And that creates a protein that helps you develop an, um, an immune response to COVID to help you fight it more effectively. And what we're trying to do is with genetic diseases, there's usually a mutation that causes either a protein to be created um, like a misfolded or misshaped protein that doesn't do its job accurately or there's a mutation that prevents the protein from being developed at all there's something called like a stop codon that prevents your body from actually making the proteins it's supposed to be making that can be caused by a mutation or your body is making too much of a bad protein where in some part of cellular system you're making too much of something that you actually don't want to have around so what we try to do is we develop a guide rna which is a little piece of rna that would bind to the target RNA that's already in your body. And then we rec recruit a enzyme that's already in your body, it's called ADAR, and it comes and it edits that RNA and fixes the issue. So we either correct the protein so that it's created the way that it's supposed to, we um, make the protein in the first place if it was being stopped from being made by a mutation, or we introduce a mutation to make less of a bad protein. So that's all the different ways that we can edit your RNA to try to fix a very wide range of genetic diseases. So, so something like CRISPR wouldn't work to solve this this sort of challenge, basically, or that that sort of genetic mutation or issue. Yeah, it's a great. I think that there's 
room and this is like a very cutting edge controversial topic um, yeah it kind of depends on what you're trying to edit so if you think about we're trying to edit um, a bunch of neuro targets so we publicly disclose like alzheimer's and parkinson's where yeah. it's really hard to make edits in your brain it's really hard to get big proteins like CRISPR to your brain and if you think about making an edit to your dna by a bacterial mm -hmm. protein like CRISPR. And again, I'm not the scientist, so any scientist listening, sure. you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, one of our, one of our questions that I think the industry has is if your DNA is edited by CRISPR, your body kind of puts up protein signals that say like, Hey body, this, my, my DNA was edited by a bacteria. And sometimes mm -hmm. your immune system goes through and clears those cells. So is that really going to be like a permanent and effective edit or huh. will your body clear out the edited cells? Whereas because we're using a fully human system, we're relying on your own editing mechanisms that exist in your body for all sorts of everyday purposes. The mm -hmm. hope is that it would provide um, a longer term edit that wouldn't be cleared by your body um, because it's not a foreign edit. If you think about it, it's not a bacterial program edit. What does this look like from a therapeutic perspective? Like, are you going to the hospital every six months or a year or something for a blood transfusion? Like, what does it look like from a patient <laughs> perspective? It's very early. We're not even in the clinic yet. So I okay. can't promise anything. <laughs> yeah. um, but the cool thing is, even though we're editing your RNA, we basically, when we deliver, the, oh, this is, we're getting really technical now, Tyler, but you, you asked yeah. the question. <laughs> <laughs> um, when you deliver what we deliver actually it would be like a shot into your body and what we would deliver is a virus hmm. the virus goes to the cell that we're trying to edit so let's say it's a muscle cell or a mm -hmm. neuron or a heart cell the virus infects the cell and delivers um, a piece of dna <laughs> the okay. dna codes for the guide rna that then helps make the edit so as long as that DNA that got delivered by your vi by the virus is in the cell, then you don't ever need mm -hmm. another injection because that DNA is there and it will produce the guide RNA and it will cause the edit. That's the hope. Um, so in cells like neurons or in heart tissue that don't divide a lot, it would probably only mm -hmm. be a one-time treatment because you just deliver it once and then the cells have the DNA package needed huh. to make the guide RNA, to make the edit. And something like your skin that's changing all the time, like our therapy probably wouldn't be the right approach because then right. your, your skin cells are dividing constantly. So then you would need lots of, maybe it's still the right approach, but then you'd need more doses um, to be delivered. Getting, that's super fascinating. That makes sense. <laughs> it does. It does. Yeah. And, uh, and, and I, I really wanted to understand this because I, I want our listeners to understand, you know, what, what some of the novel sort of legal issues are that you find most yeah. interesting in this space. Uh, and mm -hmm. I don't think you can really understand that unless you actually understand at least a little bit of the science behind or, or how this works. Um, yeah. so <laughs> with, with that, <laughs> what are, what are some of the legal issues that, that you're working on that of course you can talk about in the sort mm -hmm. of gene editing space that you find most interesting? Um, so given that we went way deeper on science than I thought we were going to, and we're going to keep going with that a little bit. Um, yeah. So while right now we're, you know, we're preclinical, we, we haven't even treated any humans yet, but we're working to get there, you know, as quickly as we can. I think what's really exciting is that right now, if you think about how drugs are developed, they're developed for big buckets of disease, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, different types of cancer. There's not really drugs that are made for you, Tyler, or for me, Lisa. They're not N of one therapies or what we call them. But because our system is all dependent on just making that little guide RNA that we deliver, we can make that guide RNA edit whatever we need it to edit, right? And so the whole goal, the ultimate goal is that we create this really big platform where yes, we could treat big bucket diseases that are common mutations, but we could also just as easily make that guide RNA edit a mutation that like you're the only person in the world that has. And so I think this comes back to like the personalized medicine approach. Those are some really interesting legal issues to think about. How is our drug development and regulatory framework set up to right now we do it on huge clinical trials, huge diseases, common approaches. But as we advance drug development, how do we say, well, we know exactly what Tyler's mutation is. We know exactly how to fix it. We have a safe way to do that based on all these other things where we've shown that we've treated big, big indications safely. 
how what's the path to do that? And I think that's really fun to think about. And it's we're yeah. just at the start of it. Um, but it's something that we're excited to think about with the FDA and other regulatory authorities around the world. That's Maybe a, a, a last question. What's the role of companies that are developing these therapies? It, especially if maybe existing regulatory frameworks or, or processes don't quite work in, in building trust in them, like in building trust in the therapies. And I, I think that the past few years have, have even maybe made some people question whether or not they should trust. I don't think necessarily rightly so, right? But some people mm-hmm. out there question whether they should trust sort of the existing regulatory processes, which are... Yeah for bigger and, you know, right, like, and are run on Mm -hmm. large clinical trials. And so like, what's, what's the role of of companies like Shape or or other pharma companies in, I don't know, almost readying the public, I guess, for and and building trust in a totally new paradigm? Yeah, I think it actually does go back, though, to like, we just need to build trust in the processes with the regulatory authorities. I don't think there's Mm -hmm. any contemplation that we would try to bring this forward. Um, without that, I think it's that's why it's interesting as a legal standpoint and that yeah. we need to go to the FDA, we need to go to EMA, the European equivalent, and educate about what we're trying to do. How do we show that it's safe? Because it shouldn't be rolled out to that end of one until we really have proven that it works for bigger mm-hmm. groups or until we have a, um, you know, an informed consent and a trial policy that would let you know you, Tyler, decide if you want to try something like this. I think that's kind of what we saw as a result of the COVID vaccine. There was a lot of discussion about like what level of individual choice should be contemplated in our regulatory regimes. And I think to the trust part, so another legal issue that we work on a lot as well is just how AI is totally transforming drug development. Um, We have really exciting public tools that come from like Google, like AlphaFold that show you how any protein folds in the whole world. and you make made up proteins, anything you can create. And what we do at Shape is, you know, we have a huge data science team. Um, we have machine, machine learning experts. And what we're trying to do is develop, have the AI be able to say, this is what the guide should look like. Instead of it being in a wet lab experiment where it takes scientists years and years to figure out what's the exact guide that works for this exact type of mutation. You just feed all that data into the AI and the AI says, here's 10 guides that should work, go test them. And so how do you think about that with intellectual property, with copyright based on where those training data sets came from, trade secrets, just like the ethics of it eventually, yeah. like any edit in your genome that you want to make in 20 years, who decides how, like that, that's way farther than anything I'm thinking about right now. But there are, I think, some really <laughs> interesting legal and ethical issues that we'll have to uh, confront in the not so distant future. Okay, I lied. One last question on yeah. <laughs> uh, on shape. Would would this be possible without um, large machine learning, large data sets, uh, without AI broadly? Do you think, or or is this is this going to happen, or at least is it going to happen in a, a sort of like reasonable timeline, not like fifty five years, right? Because of AI. I think it could happen without, because right, like Shape was founded before we had a whole machine learning data science team where like you can do it scientifically. Um, But I think through other advisory companies I have that do AI as well, I think the biggest change is that instead of that slow hypothesis driven drug discovery, like a scientist has an idea about a pathway and then you do an experiment in the lab and then you get the data from that one experiment and then you do the next experiment and that just takes time. Um, the AI lets us run lots of experience, experiments simultaneously and comes up with new ideas that, you know, so quickly that maybe humans wouldn't have thought of. And so I think it really is a very cool example of biology and computer science coming together to create something new and to do things faster. It's probably the biggest impact it will have. Leaving shape behind for just a second, uh, I want to ask you about your newest venture, which is is part of the way that we got connected. Um, it's called EffectiveInhouse.com. Tell us a little bit about what you started and and why you decided to to launch this resource for in-house lawyers. Yeah. Um, so as part of, we didn't do a whole bio, but Shape is my fourth in-house company. I started out at a big law firm prior to that, but always knew I wanted to be in-house. 
And I just kind of kept seeing the same repeating themes now that I've been in-house at four different companies, brought on in-house legal teams, trained those legal teams of in-house law is its own practice. It's different than being a law firm lawyer. It's different from being a, you know, a subject matter specialist. You really have to understand what your business is doing. You have to be a partner in that business. You can't be, um, you can't be viewed as like a problem to that business. And so I just kept finding myself saying the same things over and over to my legal teams. And I, my husband told me that I had to stop talking about it and just do it. And so I had the idea <laughs> of creating a resource that would be focused on some of these core lessons that I've learned throughout my in-house career that would hopefully help other in-house lawyers. Um, the other thing is I, I love learning. We're lawyers, right? We like learning from books. We like reading things. And I kept mm-hmm. finding that there wasn't a good resource out there where I could say, like, I wanted to Google, like, how do I how do I approach this meeting with my executive team to mm-hmm. discuss a complicated legal issue? How do I approach presenting to the board? How do I approach um, the trade off between legal risk and business value in a in a contentious meeting with my marketing team that wants to do something that I don't think we should do? And yeah. so I wanted to have resources that were in writing and you know you can go to effective in-house and check it out i have like a matrix about how you you know think about legal risk versus business value and how you communicate that to your business team and then i wanted to learn as well when you're at a small in-house company you don't have a huge legal team to learn from and so a big part of it was being able to interview other lawyers that are in-house about how they approach issues what they've learned and be able to share that with the community as well do you have an idea about how you want it to evolve over time or you're just ready to see where, see where it leads? <laughs> I think I'm just going to see where it leads. I'm just going to keep doing it while it's fun. I'm learning a ton. Um, it helps me connect with great people like you to talk about these projects and what it's like to be in house. And, you know, my goal, and I'm actually, I'm, I went to Harvard law school and I have, I'm talking to them about, you know, maybe figuring out some sort of class, but my goal would be to just expose lawyers earlier to what it means to be an in-house lawyer. I think law school uh-huh. sets you up on such a trajectory of litigation, law firms, here's the path based on our curriculum from like the 1850s. Like I haven't done property <laughs> law in my entire career. I don't know if you have, and yet I spent a whole semester of learning about it. Um, I want there just to be more resources and more discussion of what it mm-hmm. means to be an in-house lawyer available to, to all practitioners, no matter what stage of their career. If, uh, if you had to make a recommendation and, and I know this would be tough for me if someone came to me and said, Hey, like what, you know, one or two episodes of the abstract did someone listen to, but if there were one or two posts or interviews on effective mm-hmm. that you think folks should start with, yeah. Where, where should they begin? So there's, I think one of my favorite posts was one that I had, that I talk about all the time with my team and with my businesses, which is a tactics post, which is about how to balance legal risk with business value. I really tried to have it be tactical with what do you say to your team? How do you show them how you're making these trade-offs? And so that would be a tactic. Um, And then for interviews, one of my favorite interviews is with Brett Pletcher, who is the GC of Gilead, you know, Fortune 100 biopharma company, thousands and thousands of employees, products that transformed medicine and HIV treatment specifically. He was there for something like 15 years and just, full of great tactics and insights about what it means to be a leader at a big company like that. Um, and if you're looking for a more fun way in, um, I have an interview with Brandon Etheridge, who is the GC of the Baltimore Ravens NFL football team. So that was really fun as well to get to talk to him about what are similarities between our jobs? What are differences? And it's funny. It's all, I think it's so much more similar than people think, despite the big differences in our industries. That's so awesome. That's another fun um, I actually with. have read that one and I really enjoyed yeah. that one. I, I'm going to have to check out uh, the one with, with uh, Brett Pletcher. That sounds Brett. really interesting. Yeah. And we can link to these yeah. in the, in the show notes too. Um, Great. Just, uh, just a couple more questions for you. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, I'm a big reader. I travel all the time for work. I like to read while I'm traveling uh, as opposed to trying to send emails on the plane. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It sounds like you're a big reader as well. Hey, what's a good book yep. that you've read or a few good books maybe that you you've read recently? So you set me up perfectly because I actually have an effective in-house post about this. They're like oh, my favorite business book. <laughs> um, so check those out. Uh, but the one that I'll just call out, it's 
such an old school book. It's from the 60s. It's called Effective Executive. You can maybe guess where I got inspiration for the name for Effective In-House <laughs> based on that. Um, but it really is full of tactics. How do you think about how you spend your time, what you prioritize? And it's meant you know, broadly for executive, but I think it's really just how do you manage your own time and how do you think about what you what you should work on that adds value to your business. So it's from the 60s. You have to get over some like antiquated language about, you know, having your secretary type up your notes on her typewriter. But if you can look past <laughs> that part, I think right. it's full of a lot of um, very practical tips on how to do things. Um, and then I have some other great, you know, ones that I like, you know, Adam Grant, the, sure. all of his books I think are fantastic. Um, but anyways, there's a post on that. Um, for fun, I love reading a wide mix of things. If you like adventure travel books, I just read this book yeah. called High, it's called High, and it's all about the Himalayas. So it weaves like a personal travel narrative sure. with the history of India, Pakistan, Nepal, Tibet, and Bhutan. And it's just really well done. It's like a combination of history and this woman's travels um, throughout the region. So highly recommend that one. Yeah, um, I'll be in India very it. shortly, so I might actually buy that one for this trip. Oh, you uh, should. Yeah. It is yeah. really good. I, I learned so much about the history, but I have a hard time just reading like pure dense history. And so what I liked uh -huh. is like, each chapter she wove in, you know, her experience talking to um, talking to someone at the temple, along with like the history of Buddhism yeah. in the region. So it yep. was like a nice mixture. Um, so it made it more approachable. And I learned a lot about the region. Um, we'll have to talk offline about your trip to India. I loved my trip to India. So fantastic. We'll, we'll yeah. discuss later. Yes. Um, and my <laughs> final post is that I love sci fi. So if people have not read Dune, don't just watch the movie. Please go read the book. It's one of my absolute all time favorites. So, anyways, I hit you with a lot of books there, but I love reading. So I can talk That's about that great. all day. Very cool. Um, as we start to wrap up, Lisa, I've got just sort of one last question for you, something that I like to ask most of, if not all of our guests. And that's, mm -hmm. you know, if you could look back on your days of being a, a young lawyer, just getting started, uh, having just graduated from law school, what's something that you would wish you'd known then that, that you know now? I think it, I kind of mentioned this earlier about educating people on what it means to be an in-house lawyer, but I think yeah. I, I was so convinced that being a lawyer meant you had to write briefs and write memos and dig into the details of case law, which I frankly hated. When I first joined the law school, started law school, I was like, oh, maybe I made a mistake and this isn't what I want to do um, because I did not like doing those things. <laughs> um, and luckily <laughs> I got exposure to other areas of law kind of through reaching out and kind of creating my own path during law school. But I think it's really knowing that if you like business problems, if you like a specific area, you can really forge your own path and work on those things as a lawyer that is part of a company's mission. And you can really impact and um, influence how that company moves forward and delivers products to patients, consumers, whoever, you know, whoever you're serving. But you can really have a big influence without having to ever write a brief or a memo or use Westlaw. <laughs> Well, this has been fantastic. Your your passion for patients and the products that, that the companies you've worked for are building really comes through. Um, thank you so much for, for joining this episode of The Abstract with me, Lisa. Absolutely. I loved it. Thank you so much. Uh, and to all of our listeners out there, thanks so much for listening. And we hope to see you next time. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd recommend that you give my interview in Season 2 with Juno Rowe, Head of Strategic Legal Initiatives at the UC Office of the President, a listen. We talk about how to build a culture of inclusion, ethics, and compliance for your organization. You can also subscribe so you get notified as soon as we post a new episode. And if you liked this one, I'd really love to hear your thoughts, so leave a rating or a comment. If you'd like to reach out to us, our LinkedIn profiles are in the description. See you all next week.